Welcome everyone. It's that time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Cheryl Rogers, the Director of Marketing here at Golden Helix, and today is a very exciting day for us here as Gabe Rudy is about to introduce Varseek to the community. First up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Andreas Scheer, our President and CEO. He'd like to say a few words about Golden Helix and our entry into the clinical testing market. Andreas, the floor is yours. Cheryl, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, welcome to this webinar on introducing Varseek, variant discovery and gene panels made easy. This is an exciting day for us. Today is the first time that we tell the public all about our new product Varseek and the work we have quietly done over the last few years with, cl uh, with clinical testing labs. The adoption of genetic services is key to our ability to provide personalized medicine in the future. The goal is to better diagnose diseases, predict their outcomes, and to choose the best possible care option for our patients. Golden Helix part here is essentially to build the equivalent of an MRI for the genome. In this process, the latest research on disorders can be combined with our understanding of the best treatment options at any given time. Varseek supports both gene panel based diagnostics as well as whole exome and genome analysis. Gabe Rudy, who is the head of product development here at Golden Helix, will spend a good chunk of this webinar telling you all about the capabilities we provide and the workflows we support. Now, uh, up to this point, we had two products out in the market. And can you go to the next slide, please? So we had two products. One is the SNP and Variation Suite, SVS, uh, as well as Genome Browse. Between the two of them, we have worldwide about 6,000 users in over 300 organizations. Our products are used for research in humans, plants, and animals. We have been cited in over 850 publications so far. Now here's an interesting data point. Over the last few years, we had a number of clients using SVS um, that, uh, sorry, we had a number of clients using SVS as part of their analytics pipeline in clear certified testing labs. Our clients created very detailed and repeatable workflows that were used to improve their diagnostic capabilities. As we worked with research hospitals across the world, we were faced with a new set of requirements. Our customers asked for a simpler solution as their workflows stabilized and they wanted to ramp up the number of tests. At some point, we decided to use the technology stack behind SVS and Genome Bryos to build a new product. The outcome of this process, what we will show you today. Now, the, the question is, why are we doing this now? Why didn't we do this earlier? You go to the next slide, please. The simple answer is that we believe that the market is just about now ripe for a solution like this. In our view, for NGS data to become broadly used in a clinical setting, a number of factors have to come into play. Uh, and it, it turns out that this is not only about producing a state-of-the-art software package. There are a number of other factors, and I have um, them here on the slide. I would just like to touch on a few of them uh, that I would like to highlight. <clears throat> so there is the regulatory landscape, and this is still a wide open field. Um, the FDA is paying increasingly attention to this field very publicly. It engaged with 23andMe to review their processes and procedures. While this gave the adoption uh, somewhat of a pause in the short term, it I mean mid and long term that we will count on a consolidated governance that protects patients while enabling clinicians to make better and informed decisions. Another important point is uh, reimbursement. The adoption of these tests uh, in the clinic hinges on the ability for doctors to recover the expenses for genetic tests. For this to occur, the, both the quality of the results produced from these tests uh, must be at a very high and reliable level, but also the price points have to become reasonable for payers to accept these tests as part of standard care. And then another big area that I'd like to point out is uh, physician education and acceptance. We're facing the need to educate a wide range of healthcare specialists involved in designing 
conducting, interpreting, and of course, utilizing genetic tests. And this also involves the support personnel, such as nurses and uh, assistants. There is a, a new ebook coming out here from Golden Helix that discusses this aspect of genetics adoption um, in more detail. I'll talk about this uh, at the end of the webcast in, uh, in more detail. In general, we share the optimism in our field that these issues will be resolved quickly. Uh, there are a number of areas where we see uh, rising testing volumes and uh, the big three that at this point that I would uh, point out are oncology, rare diseases, and pediatrics. Now let me talk about one issue that we have with the current market situation. Uh, there are a number of vendors in this space that have actually chosen, some of them actually have chosen to, to be here with us uh, this morning, uh, what, uh, that make the licensing of technology for clinical testing very expensive and complicated. So uh, when we did our own research, uh, we found upfront fees and then there are additional fees per sample. and. Uh, we have to, chosen to go a different road. Uh, we have adopted a very simple pricing model. It's an annual license fee that includes all the support and training needed to get our clients up and running. Uh, we really don't want to get involved in our clients' business. So, quite frankly, we're happy if you run hundreds, thousands, or for that matter, any number of samples uh, every month through our software. We won't charge you extra for being successful, essentially. Uh, for over 15, almost 16 years, we at Golden Helix have provided tools for the research community to better understand the underlying mechanisms that cause disease. As our field is ripe to take the next step, we will do the same for clinicians, genetic counselors, and any other medical specialist who need to study genomic data for diagnostic purposes. By doing so, we have the opportunity to improve patient outcome, helping to fight diseases of our time, such as cancer, Alzheimer and diabetes. It's now my distinct pleasure to hand this webinar over to Gabe Rudy, our VP of Product Development, who worked with his team very hard to build out RSEEK. Gabe? Uh, thank you very much, Andreas. So I am extremely excited to be presenting VARSEEK to you this morning. This has been the culmination of really years of effort of the entire team of Golden Helix, and today will be the first public demonstration of that uh, product and showcasing it live. So to give you a little bit of an agenda to ground what we'll be doing today, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the roots of RSEQ. Andreas gave you a great overview of how Golden Helix is entering this market and what, we, what our strategy is, but I can talk a little bit about the technical and the product development process that brought us to the point of releasing this first version of RSEQ and how it's quite unique as a first version of any tool. The majority of the time, though, I'm going to spend demonstrating the capabilities of RSREQ because really I feel like by showing it instead of just talking about it, you will see uh, in, in much more clear detail whether this is a great tool for your lab. Okay, and then finally, we'll wrap up by letting Andreas give you a preview of what's coming up into the future uh, later this year as well as going into next year. If you're not familiar with how this GoToMeeting interface works, there will be a little docket in your, uh, your panel here, feel free to start asking questions at any time. We'll re reserve some time at the end to answer those questions. We may not get to all of your questions, but we'll certainly have time to take a couple, and we can always follow up with you offline. So as I mentioned, Varseek is not your standard version one product. It is built on a core foundation of strength. Really, the strength of the components of technology that Golden Helix has, as well as the product development team with their collective experience and the process we have built to build products, allows us to build Varseek and, and provide it in its first release with possibly the strongest, most flexible, and powerful um, uh, tool amongst its peers. What we did to build this was really sticking to some of our core design philosophies. Now, over the 16 years of Golden Helix existence building genetic analysis software, we've seen a lot of change. The technology has changed dramatically. 
the scale of data has changed dramatically, the types of users in terms of both their training and background and the types of analyses they are doing has changed. We've gone from looking at data mostly in a statistical manner to having to apply a bioinformatics set of algorithms and um, analyses processes. And now we're starting to see people coming in with more of a microbiology or technical lab background and needing to be doing things in a, in a high throughput environment. And that is, a, again, another dramatic shift, as Andreas mentioned. But throughout all this change, we have focused as Golden Helix in building things to allow and really empower users to do complex analysis themselves. And core to that goal and core to enabling that goal is the integration of our support process with our product development process. And this goes back to the licensing model of enabling and providing training and support along with the software. And the way this works is that if you call up Golden Helix and you need to get something done that you haven't quite figured out, we will spend time training you. If it's a new feature, we can build an SVS custom scripts with our bioinformatics team. If you're really pushing the boundary, we might put a new feature on the product roadmap and turn you into a stakeholder to help us understand the requirements of that feature. And if you're really going out there, like some users of SVS have been doing, and putting SVS into a CLIA certified environment, then we'll recruit you if you would like to be part of the stakeholder process of a whole new tool like Varseek. <clears throat> and this is really the process we use to build Varseek. From the very first conceptual ideas to the prototypes on whiteboards to the very first runnable prototypes to the shippable prototypes, we went back and forth with our stakeholders over and over again, many, many hours of meetings, making sure that we're nailing the requirements, the user experience, and the ultimately making this thing scale and work under the, under the environment that they are looking to run it. And so, as I mentioned all these things in our product development process, what we're also building on is the core technology of Golden Helix. So in a couple years ago, we released Genome Browse, and we really spent a lot of time rebuilding our technology stack to make it so that you would never know that when you're looking at this very fluid and dynamic interface for visualizing data, that we're processing tens and gigabytes of data in the background and handling all these public file formats and giving you this fluid experience. So we spent time in Genome Browse building up this new technology stack to allow for a very interactive and fluid analysis of NGS data. We brought that technology into SVS with SVS8. And if you're not familiar, SVS8 has in it all of the algorithmic capabilities that we're going to be talking about today with Varseek, or really all the features that are in Varseek. So when Varseek is, build, is built off of all these things, we're not building version one algorithms. We're building optimized and focused algorithms using the same technology. And all that focus is around this new requirement and this focus of the whole product of building repeatable workflows making it easy to take a set of steps, whether they're adding annotations, constructing filters, you know, optimizing the view of your table, and bundling all that up into a workflow that now you can repeat with simply just selecting a new sample or a set of samples as your inputs, and all the rest of it is taking care of it for you. So that's really what we're building. That's really how we have built Varseek. And as I go into demonstration mode, I want to focus on three design goals and use those as the centering of three episodes of demonstration. And these design goals are to make Varseek simple for the case where you are running repeatable workflows. We can make it simple in terms of what you need to actually be looking at, how you set up your workspace, the uh, number of steps you have to take to accomplish something. But it also needs to be flexible. All this complexity that we have over the years collectively grown to be able to, uh, to handle, we need to still empower users, as has always been our goal, to be able to harness that and build their own workflows. Put no limitations on what you're annotating or what you're filtering against or using internal data sources or public data sources. So I'll touch on a second episode, we'll really do a big broad sweep of a lot of these capabilities used to construct your own or customize a workflow. And finally, and this is something we've always also aspired to at Golden Helix, is making this scale and making it scale on your own resources. So being able to handle not just gene panels, but whole exomes and whole genomes on your desktop. This is something we do in SVS, and we even improve that with Varseek. We're using our file format that allows for inherent compression of your data. You can copy this data, it's your own data, it's privately secured on your own systems, into your archives, come back to it years later, 
everything that was used in that project, the annotations, the data from the project, etc., is all still there, and it's internally compressed. We're talking about gene panels with dozens of samples and all of their annotations just being tens of megabytes, exomes being hundreds of megabytes, very easy to archive and reuse. And of course, you can always go back to your old projects, update them with the latest annotations and algorithms. So we're not just talking about scaling from thousands to millions of variants, but scaling the user interface to handle the complexity of more complex analyses and scaling the data management and archiving to work on your local computer where you would normally might think that this is stuff that has to be done on big clusters of servers. Okay, in this first demonstration, we're going to focus on the design goal of how we made Varseq simple. To start with, one of the things we noticed and the great adoption that Genome Browse has, and I think one of the things that has contributed to that adoption is how easy it is to get started using Genome Browse. It's a free tool to start with, so that obviously makes it easy, but you just go to our website, you download it, run the installer, and get to a screen where you can either log in, or if you need to create your own Genome Browse or Golden Helix account, and then log in, and then immediately start adding data to view. And we decided, why don't we copy that same model for Varseq? Varseq will have a free mode to view existing projects. So these include projects that we created to demonstrate Varseq, projects your friend may have created or you created on a different computer, or maybe your core lab is creating projects and letting you have those full access to those projects as a deliverable so that you can investigate not just the final results, but intermediate results, click around to see how the data got to its different views, export that data, use Genome Browse as the visualization. So we really are trying to focus on making this an easy experience to get up and started with Varseq. Obviously, what I mentioned before about repeatable workflows only works if you have good starting points. And for our starting points, we're going to try to create some great best practice workflows for different use cases, including trio analysis of exomes and gene panel analysis for oncogenes, as well as inherited diseases. And so whether we're going to, we're also going to focus on having some very specific workflows designed for a specific target kit. So if you have like an ion torrent cancer hotspot V2 panel, um, if we don't have support for that, we'll work with you to help build that workflow and consult with you. And then we can share that workflow with the community and build up the library. So we are plan on having Varseq fully stocked and ready to go so there's always something to get started. Of course, you could always start from scratch if you wanted to, but we feel that most of the time you're going to have a good starting point that gets you to some interesting results. The next thing we noticed is that people, especially in a high throughput environment, don't work with samples one at a time. They work with the batches that are delivered to them either from their sequencer or their core lab or their upstream vendor. And so we wanted to make Varseq work in the batch environment extremely well, and we'll demonstrate how that works. And finally, it's all about when you're in a lab environment, making sure that you can have everything you need to make the test decisioning you need to make to support that decisioning process um, in as simple and as focused an interface as possible. So to do that, we focused on the user experience, the layout, how we can hide and show data, and still enable you to have all of that in that workflow process. So when you open up your workflow, it shows you the data that you need to see. All right, let's demonstrate Varseq getting started here. So here we go, I'm going to launch Varseq, and again, the getting started process is going to be very straightforward. You can install and register Varseq when we ship it to our public audience, and if you are running in few, uh, the free viewer mode, you'll be able to open existing projects, um, and as soon as you have a licensed copy, it basically your account just has a license applied to it. It turns on the flag to be able to create new projects. And as I mentioned, we're coming fully stocked with a set of gene panels. Here are a couple panels that we're in development right now. We're going to use this comprehensive cancer gene panel. Uh, one of our stakeholders graciously shared us with us some ion torrent data. So this is a great example of one of those very common and popular ways of starting NGS testing is uh, creating a, a cancer gene test. So I'm going to go ahead and do cancer gene test project. Okay, so again, we're starting with a template. This template has not only a set of annotations, but a set of filters applied to it and a default visual uh, setup of the workspace. So that includes how the tables are laid out, etc. So as I hit go, 
I'm prompted with a screen to add my data to this existing template, and this is where the workflow can kick off. So the data I'm going to select is uh, four samples, each in different VCF files. VCF files are the product of what comes out of a desktop sequencer like a MySeq or an Ion Torrent PGM. Um, when you set them up, you after you load up your samples, you specify a workflow, in this case a cancer gene panel workflow, and after the sequencing is done, it will do the alignment and calling of variants and put them in these files. So we go ahead and hit next on this. We get to see the sample names that you specified when you set up that, that sequencing project. That you can specify different sample names if you like to. If you have controls in your group, you can set those to be controls, etc. Get a little summary of what's going on here. There's advanced options if you need them. And then what I'm going to do is hit go. This is going to happen very quick, so I have to explain quickly what's happening. Immediately what I'm doing is processing that data. I have 6,000 variants across those four samples already imported. A couple annotation sources are being filled in in the background asynchronously as we go. And this filtering process is updating to include all of those. So here is my filter chain. So this is also my sample selection up here. And you can see as I change my current sample from one to another, this is a batch mode system, so I can switch it. This, the, the data here now represents that sample going through the filter chain. I go to the next sample. Another, there's five variants here, seven variants here, et cetera. And this table is already focused to just give me a couple um, columns out of the total set that I could for these annotations. I have cosmic and, and gene annotations. So I have everything he I need here to, to start documenting the evidence for my analysis. I have details of the current variant. I have data about what gene they're in, the types of mutations, um, information about cosmic. You can drill down by clicking on any of these um, contextual links, etc. You can export the data. And that's really what this is about, is making this simple. And as you can see, in a matter of, of uh, really seconds, I was able to start the workflow and get to the point of starting the test interpretation process. OK, I'm going to come back to this project as I go through into the next section. But getting back to our agenda here, the next episode of demonstration is going to now be a much larger one where I focus on the flexibility and really that, that process of empowering you to be able to do what could be con conceived as complex things, but really we're going to make this extremely um, flexible and intuitive. And so in this mode, let's go through a, a list of things that we'll cover here. The first one is about drilling down. Now, I just looked at a couple samples, and really this is going to be common for a gene panel this size. You might only have a couple variants to inspect per sample. Really, you can look at things at a gene level view or a variant level view. Um, I had a variant level view up. But what if you want to drill down and start to see what's going on? Maybe you have a variant that doesn't that looks suspicious, or this is going to be also part of the process of developing your own workflow, is becoming comfortable with what's coming off of the sequencing machine, the upstream process that you have, and making sure that all of the details of the filtering process, the annotations, the data that you're visualizing, which columns of these sources you're seeing, and all that is available. Also, we have the full library of annotations from our Golden Helix and SVS products available in Varsi. If you haven't seen the many times we've posted about the nitty gritties of this on our blog, uh, feel free to go back into our blog archives. We spend a lot of time making these public data sources ready for analysis with lots of contextual hyperlinks um, and high quality curations, and we keep them up to date. We also enable you to add filters to this, um, this filter chain that you saw on the left to construct that off of anything in your data or any of these annotations. We're not limiting you to just a couple fields that we expect to be in a VCF file. If there's some strand bias metric that you want to consider as a good QC metric, go ahead and inspect that value and put it into your filtering process. And of course, we have that visualization capability of what I think is the best genome browse experience in the market integrated in there, integrated to look at your project data, to look at external data like BAM files that would support your sample evidence, and to include all the public data you might want to give you that genomic context. And often, even if you're not looking at things like BAM files, just knowing which region you're in, what is the sequence locally, all of that information can really help um, invalidate that you're looking at a high quality variant or interpret the complexity of that variant's impact on, say, the protein or the biology. 
We also talked about the fact that you can customize your views, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit. I'm not going to go into it right now because we can show it live and I'll give a better example. But really this is about taking advantage of the fact that as desktop software, we're not sort of you know, stuck inside of a, a single tab of a web browser or having you to force to jump between multiple tabs, we can take a full advantage of your desktop windowing environment. If you have two monitors and you want to set it up, so you have Genome Browse on one monitor and your data on the other, you can do that. You can move things around to get the, the maximum number of vantage points you need to interpret it and at the same time maybe create a very simple view and that is maybe what you want to start your focus on and move everything else out of the way. And of course, if you've used Geno Browse, you've seen how we can take screenshots of your plots, you can copy information from your tables and your projects and your details, and all that's going to be supported in a mode that allows you to document your evidence that you want to put in your lab report. Okay, so now let's start the second uh, demonstration of our Seek's capabilities here. Excuse me, I just needed to grab some water, so I'm not getting up. Too dry. Okay, so to start with, let's talk about drilling down. Drilling down can mean simply looking at more than just the final output of this filtering process. So even though I'm starting with these seven variants for this sample two, maybe I wanted to expand these cards, we call these cards here, and see what's going on at this level. So you can see actually that I am looking at just missense variants here. These are our medium impact. Maybe I want to include low impact variants. I just click on that bucket, it highlights it, and now you can see that my seven variants has updated to eight. All of these numbers, in fact, are clickable. And so if I click on this 37, I could see the results of the filtering up to this step, or up to this step, or up to this step, or see the all 6,000 variants, etc. I can click on these buckets themselves and look at just the four high impact variants. You can see I got a couple stop gains and a frame shift here. Um, I can you know, disable this and go back to where I was and go back to my final results. And all this is a very flexible way of investigating and drilling down at the, at the, um, at the filter chain level. I also have the full richness, and actually I want to look at maybe these high, high impact variants, these are pretty interesting, of this detailed view uh, where I can actually start to see uh, what's going on uh, at this row and pull in all the annotations available. This, this includes those hyperlinks, so again I can bring in uh, hyperlinks to bring in pages. I can actually um, um, I'm gonna go ahead and dock this to my, my window so I can maybe go back and forth and, and see those hyperlinks as well um, for other samples or for other variants. And you can also customize which fields that I'm looking at in my table. So I have a couple different sources that I've annotated against, my gene tracts and my cosmic tracts. If I go to show hide, you can see that I have more details about cosmic. Maybe I want to hide everything except for the uh, primary site and histology of the sample. So I can see for these variants, you know, which, which portions of, um, what types of samples are being collected and documented in, in the cosmic, so this, these variants seem to be largely in carcinomas, etc. So that's the ability to drill down and show details and really get into using this as your interpretation platform. Every single row you click on, you can expand that out and, and keep all this in here, and as you save your project, you save all of that state. The other thing was can we add other annotation sources? And the answer is of course, and it's really easy. So we click on add up here at my table level, say annotate with a data source, and you have the full library of annotation sources available with Golden Helix. And again, we keep these up to date. You can see we have gene-based tracks here, RefSeq, ENCODE, GenCode. Um, we also have gene annotations, uh, clinical databases like ClinVar and ClinVitae, functional predictions. And you can also see that we're also running, oh, so here's dbSNP-141 that just came out recently. Here's ClinVar um, that was released in just last month. And if you uncheck this, you can see that we always publish all versions and keep all versions of our data annotations um, archived. So you can down any, download any version of this. And of course, once you've had it locally, it doesn't go away. It will be stable for the process. If you're validating against one set of data, you can keep that and choose when to update to a new annotation source. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and look at my local downloaded annotations. We're going to add this functional prediction track. This includes 
a set of predictions from various um, algorithms that predict the uh, essentially whether a non-synonymous mutation is damaging from SIFT and polyfan, etc., as well as some conservation schools uh, scores, right? And so I'm going to go ahead and hit select. And really, in a matter of seconds, what this does is applies that data to the 6,000 variants. And in this case, because it's functional predictions, and so here it's already at the end of my table here. Um, Instead of just giving you, let's go back to these seven variants at the end here, um, the individual scores for SIFT and polyfan, you know, polyfan thinks this one's probably damaging. We also add to this algorithm a little voting system that allows you to see how many of the variants are predicted as damaging, or how many of the, for each variant, how many of the algorithms of the five different functional prediction algorithms here in these next five columns, how many of them predict this variant as damaging? So, for example, in this case, there's three out of five of these, uh, three out of seven of these variants have all five predicting as damaging, but some of them just have a few. So this gives another uh, uh, place for us to talk about how we might customize our filtering process. Looking at this data, maybe I want to only look at these variants that have four out of five, et cetera. So let's go ahead and click on this column and say create a filter card here. And so I'm going to collapse this and this so we have this in, in uh, expanded out mode. And now you can see for these seven variants how they fall into these buckets. And I can now choose to update my filter instead of just looking at all seven variants to only look at those that have three to five out of five predicting it as damaging. And so now my uh, filtering process is updated to those six. And if I click on the, uh, if I change which sample I'm looking at, you can see how the next sample uh, is updated based on that filter. So this sample, for example, has a, uh, had six variants before. Now we filtered out another three, and now it's down to a focused three set of variants. We can choose how to um, to use this to to clarify or to to incrementally improve our template. And of course, we can save this out as a new template and use this for our workflow. Okay, so now we're looking at these six variants, and now we might want to visualize them in a little more context. So let's go ahead and use Genome Browse as that visualization engine. Give us some context. I'm going to hide that um, web browser. And so here's Genome Browse, and what we can do is go back to this tab and add our variants uh, here, and we can click on these, these little hyperlinks to zoom to individual variants. Um, and of course, it's a little bit clunky to go back and forth, and this is a good place to talk about how we can customize our workspace here to, to enable the type of thing we're doing at the moment. And at the moment, what I'm doing is inspecting variants, and I want to have Genome Browse in the table both uh, available for that process. So what I can do is I can, as you might have seen before when I drag this out, you can drag this out as a separate window. So I might, uh, for example, I don't have two monitors to show, but I might just use a uh, split screen mode to show how I can put Genome Browse to the right and this to the left. Um, let's bring Genome Browse back in here, and I'm going to show you another thing that can be used to customize what I'm looking at. We call this the quick stash. In each of our corners of our screen, we have these little buttons, and when you click on them, it takes the, the closest group of tabs and stashes them in that corner, and now you can see there's a little icon showing me what's there. So it allows me to easily get things out of the way and focus on what I want. And of course, with this drag and drop ability, and this is obviously very inspired by things like Google Chrome, we can also rearrange what we have. So let's go ahead and rearrange this. Instead of putting it here, let's put it here on the bottom. And now I have my variants down here and my table up here. And now it's much easier for me to go from one variant to the next and look at it. Okay, so we have some great visual context of what's going on, but let's bring in information that we can bring in with Genome Browse, like the actual reads themselves to validate what we're looking at. So I can browse to a, a folder that has some BAM files. If you're concerned about the fact that these look like large BAM files, you don't want to download them, well, don't worry. We actually, with Genome Browse and with this technology, we can read these directly off of the Ion Torrent server that produces them. We have a plugin for the Ion Torrent uh, community that you can put on there that allows you to add these BAM files streaming to your local computer without having to download them. So let's go ahead and add this. This is the sample re uh, related to this uh, sample two here. I'm going to hide the pileups and just focus on this. And so this looks like a nice high quality variant. That looks great. Um, let's go back to our first variant here. Uh, that looks good as well. 
um, uh-oh, this one doesn't look quite right. We're in a big string of homopolymers, and these two variants right beside each other certainly look like one of these issues where um, the homopolymers are getting confused, and so we have mutations that we're trying to detect because we're trying to do sensitive somatic detection. But you can see their genotype quality scores here are not as high as these other ones that we are looking at. So this might be motivation to adjust a parameter like that in our filtering process. So we can go up here and adjust that parameter. This is that variant quality parameter. It's actually based on this column here. It was set at 20 as a very conservative default. Let's go ahead and bump that up to 60. Um, and then as that updates, you can see that now our variants have updated to only look at things greater than 60, but that didn't quite remove these. Let's go ahead and bump it up a little bit more to 80. And immediately now those two variants have disappeared from our list. And now we're just looking at what looks like very high quality variants. If we wanted to inspect what's going on at the genome browse level, we can bring back in, remember we stashed that detail pane. Well, that detail pane can be also used to inspect anything that you click on in Genome Browse. And sure enough, everything here looks like it matches. We have the, set, the right allelic ratio of 26% that we're expecting from our table, et cetera. So there we go. This has really dived deep into a number of aspects, visualization, filtering, uh, table uh, configuration, et cetera. You get a sense that everything here is possible, and then you can still move it all out of the way and create a template that really focuses on what you want to focus on. So I'm going to go ahead and close this project because what we're going to come back to next is not this project um, and, and talk about the next design goal, which is about scalability, right? And so I mentioned it in, in the beginning about the fact that this is all about being able to go from gene panels to exomes within the same interface. And that means not just analyzing, going from analyzing thousands of variants to millions of variants but also about going from analyzing things in a relatively linear filtering process like you just saw, remove stuff here, 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 to potentially looking at multiple um, hypotheses in tandem. So if you think about how you might go about analyzing an exome <clears throat> trio, you might be looking for a rare Mendelian disorder that has a causal mutation or a putative causal mutation, but you're not quite sure the inheritance model that that disorder is going to manifest. You might be looking at both a dominant inheritance model as a possible hypothesis and a recessive. And within dominant, you're going to have a specific workflow to design to find de novo mutations, or you might expect that there might be an inherited dominant heterozygous mutation from one of the parents. And in recessive, you might be looking at the two-hit model of a compound heterozygous mutations, two variants inherited from two different loci within the same gene, or you might be looking for homozygous mutations that were in both parents and a, uh, in a, in a uh, carrier status state. So how do you kind of put all that into the same interface? And that's something we focused on scaling. The other thing is when you're dealing with millions of variants, you saw us tweaking thresholds and seeing how that updates. Can that scale to millions? Absolutely. And it becomes even more important because in, when you're looking at exomes, you're really worried about potentially losing something that is right underneath some threshold. You know, you might have an allele frequency set at 1%. Well, what if the thing that you really cared about was at 1.5%? So being able to just have this iterative process is key to understanding the robustness of those filtering steps and being able to move those out of the way and expand things out to a wider field of, of input that you might, or output that you might investigate and narrow it back down to a, a, a focused set of, of, of shortlisted variants. And finally, I mentioned that we have all these great abilities to export. You can export your full annotated tables to VCF. You can choose to export them to text files. We have Excel export. But as we start to scale to looking at multiple hypotheses, you can actually open up multiple tables. And each of those tables or tabs, really, allows you to have different intermediate results investigated. And then you can dump all of that out at once. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like <clears throat> in the demonstration of how Varseq scales. And so for this demonstration, we're really going to jump into a, uh, a project that's already been analyzed with a TRIO workflow. And this is actually a TRIO workflow that we, we plan to provide as one of our, our default workflows. And we purposefully chose a sort of ridiculously large input set of 2 million variants just to really showcase that this does scale to that size. A lot of exomes are going to be already filtered down to um, 
you know, higher quality variants, and you'll see that the majority of these variants are just very low quality things that, that never went through any filtering process. And what we're doing is now looking at five parallel columns uh, on this filtering process, and the final result of these 36 here that I can click on is the, you know, essentially the combination or binning or oaring of all of these individual uh, models. Each of these models is looking at a different potential inheritance mode and so can have everything tweaked to that. So if you have de novo mutations, you might have a higher sensitivity in terms of what allelic frequency you expect it to be at, etc. You could also take a lot of these common filters and put them in a big bucket up top or a big filtering container, but this allows for a much more um, explainable interface as we're going about this here, intuitive and allowing you to also customize each of these inheritance models. And this, so we also have two recessive inheritance models here on the side, uh, compound heterozygous and an autosomal recessive with a homozygous variant. If you're not familiar, and then uh, I wanted to point it out that we also, as before, you can click on any number and investigate it. But in this case, I also, and I'm going to hide this detail pane so we have a little more space, have in my template a single table that is investigating each of these columns outputs. Here's our de novo variants, here's our maternal het dominant, paternal het dominant, compound het is heterozygous recessive, uh, homozygous recessive. So for each of these you can see now we have three samples involved, the proband, the mother, and the father. Again, this is a batched oriented tool. You could import 30 trios at a time, go from one proband to the next with this. Right now I only have one sample in here, or one trio. And in this case, I'm looking at the compound heterozygous variants. If you're not familiar with what these look like in practice, this is a great little project because it has, in this case, an example, not very common that you, you have these in the same exon, but in this case, it helps visualize what's going on. Um, these two variants in the same exon of this gene, one is inherited from the father and one is inherited from the mother. Both are present in the sample, so you have this sort of two-hit scenario. That's what this, this filtering process was getting to. So I can go ahead and, and hide genome browse and just focus on um, looking at these, these five inheritance models. So the next thing I wanted to demonstrate is I have these tabs, and if you were doing this, this process in SVS to create these uh, different ways of looking at the samples variants would take a number of independent steps, but you would ultimately get to a similar output. You'd have five spreadsheets, etc. Then you'd export them one by one if you wanted to put them and compile them into a report. Maybe you want to pass this down to another person to look at. Here are my five inheritance models. What do you think, etc. And this is actually the feedback that we've gotten from some people who are doing exomes as a deliverable. So we thought, why not make this a lot easier? I can go to my file menu and say, export all of these tables to a single Excel file, since Excel has a multi-tab interface. This first table is just sort of my exploratory uh, work, so I'm going to hide that and just focus on these other five tables. Let's call this my uh, exome report for my trio analysis. Go ahead and hit save, and then hit export. In just a matter of seconds, I can have all that data exported into a multi-tab Excel, and then here it is, each of the tabs containing each of those sets of variants in each table. And of course, all those hyperlinks that you are seeing that we can drill down into are still available. They're right here on the text, so here's the dbSNP column. We can click on that. We can see the data from dbSNP because it will pop up open in a browser. This has a pathogenic allele annotated in ClinVar, et cetera. So this is a very rich deliverable. It keeps all of those preferences for which annotation sources you have. Notice we have about a dozen different annotation sources applied to trios to really support that, 1,000 genomes, uh, 6,500 exomes, et cetera. And all of this data can be uh, very easily configured to which fields you want, and then all of that is preserved as you choose to do your export. So finally, the last thing I wanted to touch on is that last point of can we really be confident that this process of getting to these three recessive variants isn't very sensitive or isn't sort of leaving something out um, that I might want to investigate. You know, the, the, the thresholds aren't very sensitive, but they're rather, rather robust, right? So obviously I did a lot of filtering to get to this, and I can inspect all of these steps like I showed before by expanding them out. I can see my genotype quality is... Um, a 20 here, 
there's quite a few variants that are less than 20. Um, and I could click on these buckets and just see that update as well. In this case, it didn't change anything when I clicked on that buckets. Or I could do things wholesale by just disabling this entire card. So if I say, I don't want to look at genotype quality as a filter, I don't want to look at read depth as a filter, how does that affect my output? Oh, there's another variant. So this last variant on the X chromosome has read depth of two, genotype quality of six, very low quality. Um, what's going on with the other samples? It's still there. You can see I have my, my data grouped by sample. But what if I want to just look at read depth across all three samples? So change the grouping here. There's a little button that says collate these samples, these fields by uh, field instead of by sample. Now I can see my read depth for the proband, the mother, and the father, etc. So that helps improve this uh, interpretation process as you might go back and forth, switch that back. And certainly I don't want to keep this in there, so I'm going to go ahead and re-enable those, those filters. And of course, if you want to expand out the process of interpreting this to a broader set of variants, uh, you can you know, disable any number of these filters. This last one was a pretty aggressive filter. It basically limited these variants to the ones present in genes that have been annotated to have uh, a recessive inheritance model in known disorders. This is an annotation provided by NCBI's MenGED database. I can expand out my candidates to include any gene um, that's been annotated by the Mendelian Inheritance in Man catalog, essentially any gene associated with a Mendelian disorder. That expands this out to be a quite large set. So then I might choose other ways in which I might narrow it down. For example, yeah, one of the things that I'm looking at is all variants, including many missense variants. So I got um, a lot of these. They might have, we could look at those functional prediction algorithms. Many of these are predicted as benign. I could add that filter and et cetera. I could also choose just to look at, say, loss of function variants. We have in our variant classification algorithm a full set of sequence ontology terms. So this includes, like right now, we're looking at in-frame deletions, frame shift variants. Um, again, I can just look at how many variants are in each of these buckets, choose to disable one of these buckets. Now I'm looking at just um, medium and high class uh, frame shift variants, et cetera. So you can really tune this, expand it out, and bring it back in, and that's the part of the investigation process. <laughs> okay, so. To wrap this up, there's one thing that I really need to do and then spend some time thanking all the stakeholders that made this possible. As I mentioned, they are key to the process of building not only the right capabilities, but focusing on how to provide the right experience and making sure that this first version of the tool is going to be useful to a broad range of users. And so these stakeholders go from the commercial side to the lab test side, to the small lab, to the large lab, to people doing this in CLIA environments and research environments, etc. And I really appreciate all of the many hours and many webcasts uh, that we have gone, done with them, iterating with them to provide the tool that we'll, we'll be releasing here. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Andreas and he'll give you a, an idea of what's going on the rest of this year at Golden Helix and what to expect from us. Gabe, thank you very much and again congratulations to you and uh, to your team for building uh, this fine piece of software. We already have a lot of questions coming in and I encourage you to ask more. We'll go and uh, go ahead and answer some of them at least um, in a little bit. Just let me give you a, a quick overview of what to expect from us. Um, this month of October is all about introducing Varsic to our client base. So please expect more information to come from Golden Helix, in particular leading up to ASHG in San Diego. By the way, should you be there, come to our booth. We'll be happy to show you the product one-on-one, uh, -on -one, give you more details. And besides that, we have a number of uh, scheduled presentations on our other products, SVS and Genome Browse. So just come to our booth and get your T-shirt. There is a new ebook available. Actually, we just loaded it up uh, today on our website. It's about clinical next-gen sequencing analysis. So this fits right with the topic we discussed today. Uh, and of course, if you follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook or Twitter, you'll be able to receive up-to-date information. Now, for the next month of November, can you switch to the next slide, please? Uh, we will uh, make uh, VARSIC commercially available. 
So if this product is of interest to you, then please feel free to schedule a meeting with our experts. Your account manager will be happy to help you get this scheduled. Uh, one thing I'd like you to be aware of, we will offer to our user base a great licensing option through the end of the year for the first 10 clients. On this webcast, we'll be uh, giving, uh, instead of 12 months licenses, we'll give 15 months licenses of, uh, of Varsik, which essentially is a 25% discount. But there's more in November. <clears throat> there's a, a new ebook uh, on GWAS available. Um, I think we'll make it as a download available earlier, but there will be an email uh, that comes out in November about this topic. Essentially, in this ebook, we'll describe step by step how to conduct a GWAS project in SVS. Uh, and then uh, lastly, we'll launch our Golden Helix Gives Back campaign. And uh, the background here is that a lot of people, in particular on the, com on the research side, are struggling with their grants. Some of the leading funding organizations, such as the NIH, have cut their budgets, and I think we're all painfully aware of that. Um, and we want to help. We'll give out um, some free licenses of uh, SVS and Varsic, for that matter, for those who really need it. So there will be uh, a, an application process will have a little website where you can go and you know, talk a little bit about your situation and um, of course there will be a limited number of licenses we give, give away but um, we will take the month of November to uh, let this process uh, play out and then we're going to announce this early, early December right for Christmas. So please stay tuned for more information on that. And then on the next and last slide um, we have a lot of plans uh, for both products in early 2015. Uh, we have plenty, uh, firmly planned a launch of a new release of uh, both uh, Varsic and SVS. On the Varsic side, uh, our stakeholders that um, Gabe just mentioned gave us a list of a number of nice-to-have capabilities that we firmly plan to implement. And then on the SVS side, we will focus in our upcoming 8.3 release on better support of genomic prediction, as well as the analysis of complex diseases. So there will be new, new methods in SVS that we're um, planning uh, to launch. Uh, quite frankly, if all stars align, we might push the 8.3 in uh, into December, but a little bit ahead of our schedule. But I'm at this point, uh, I don't want to promise it uh, yet. Also, early 2015, there are a number of conferences coming up. Uh, we will be at PAG in San Diego again, showing our capabilities to the plant and animal research community. And then, last but not least, we have a big showing at Tricon in San Francisco in February. Uh, I will run a session on uh, advances in computational cancer genomics. And as part of this, I will speak about the bioinformatics of cancer gene panels. So that fits right in what Gabe just presented to you. And then he will be also at Tricon uh, with two, uh, two events. He will speak about public annotation sources um, at the main event. And uh, prior to that, he will deliver, uh, again, his very popular short course. Um, so I think he has done this now a number of time, times at the, at the Tricon conferences. So there's lots going on here at Golden Helix in the next few months. We're very excited about it, and um, I think we have a little bit time for uh, a few questions um, that already came in. Uh, maybe just as a general comment, um, there's a question, can we get the presentation or the access to, to this material? And the, the answer is absolutely. Um, we will make this video available shortly after. Um, uh, probably today or uh, probably tomorrow or the next day, so you will get information about this. You don't have to take copious notes of this. Uh, you will get access to the information after this webcast. Um, one question was um, about, let me see, uh, do we uh, support sample comparison? Yeah, that's, so that's a great question, and this goes into sort of that flexibility component of RSeq. So what you saw was me using a workflow designed around trios. We obviously are going to support more complex pedigrees, 
Often those look like m more or less case control studies where you might have um, a number of families and you're looking for places where everything co-segregate. And also just being able to take two samples and construct filters where you say look at the variants that are in the sample but that, all, that sample. Um, this is all very possible. You've seen it in SVS and it's going to be just as easy to and more easy to do in VARSEQ. Yeah, all right. There are, and I try to, as I look through the questions, I try to summarize a few of them. So we, I think there is, um, there are a few questions that came in that um, ask about the flexibility of this last workflow where you showed uh, the, the five filters and um, there was a number of questions. Um, to, to what degree is this a fixed um, uh, aspect of our capability or can we customize it? I think you touched on it on your in your presentation but maybe you can speak one more time about um, how we can uh, customize this for a particular situation. Right, so the algorithms are obviously going to be very flexible but then what you're starting with with that project is just a starting point and you can use that to customize your own TRIO workflow or build a completely new one from scratch. Any project is a possible, uh, is something that can be turned into one of these templates, essentially recording all of those steps that you did to create it so that when you create it as a template and then create a new project with new sets of samples, all of those steps, all of those filters, and all of those view preferences are applied. All right, and then there's a little follow-up that I just take on this uh, question of can we handle whole genomes? Questions. Uh, the, the answer is yes, we can. Yes, yes. Uh, um, let There's an interesting one on the uh, algorithms that we're using too. Yes. Can I touch on that. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. There's a, you know, there's one question about do we use a NOVAR or SNPF? Well, the answer is, uh, again, if you read my blog post, we, we realize that there are uh, a lot of uh, solutions that are just basically built on taking open source or academic tools and packaging them up. Uh, we often find that to provide the best experience, we have to become experts, and this is one of those examples where we've, we've built our own uh, functional uh, annotation algorithm that provides those annotations of whether a variant is, you know, a frame shift or missense mutation provides those C dot and P dot and we're actually doing this in a very uh, detailed mode and we blog about the comparison we're running of all the existing tools and you can uh, double check our work and we'd be happy to integrate feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I got one question here. For, I think on uh, what what does Marcy cost? Um, uh, I think I just want to go back to the, my comment earlier, where uh, I mean, obviously uh, having these events in a very open fashion, and as I mentioned, you have a number of competitors on this on this call. So please forgive me if I don't give you the exact dollar amounts here. Uh, but we're of course happy to to have this conversation with you if you uh, know your account manager just feel free to reach out to this person and we will talk about this in detail. If you don't, then just uh, send us a quick um, request for information on our website. There are links that can be easily found on the product pages. Um, I just uh, want to reiterate what I said earlier. We have uh, we have decided to make um, both the, the pricing, the investment level reasonable and we're not charging for any samples uh, or cost per, we don't have a cost per sample model so we want to make sure that this is all um, uh, becoming very affordable so that the adoption really can occur. Let me see, let me go through the stack. Oh, there's um, <clears throat> maybe related to this, there's one client who said, well, you know, he likes SV, uh, he's an SVS client, obviously, and he likes Varseek. Um, sh uh, should, I, I, should I buy both? Should I switch? Um, <clears throat> of course, that's a very individual uh, question or a very individual situation that you have to make a decision on your own. What we will do though is for our um, SVS uh, users we will have uh, <clears throat> special considerations. So if, if you want to buy Varsic and you want to keep uh, SVS then we have some flexibility that we want to share with you. So that's, that maybe goes back to the, the pricing question that was uh, asked before that. Let me see, um, Gabe is there one other question that you'd like to jump on? Uh, one person just asked how long it takes to do one of these trio analysis like the one that I had with two million right. variants. Yes. This could be the final question because it really does again go back to our core architecture. It is going to be 
darn fast. I mean, I think in the order of 20 minutes, 30 minutes to do the importing and all of the annotations of about uh, 8 to 10 data sources. And so, again, using your local resources, this is going to be an experience that's going to far exceed uploading this to a server and waiting for a queue for a big cluster to try to do the same work and then having all that data be remote instead of local. And again, that project that I'm looking at was on the order of 100 or a couple hundred megabytes, very reasonable to be working with millions of variants. Yes, all right. Excellent. <clears throat> I think um, I have to thank um, everybody for such a strong showing. We had uh, hundreds of people on this call. Uh, there are more questions pouring in. Uh, what I can promise you is that we take a look at each of them and then try either to summarize them in a follow-on blog or come back and uh, talk to you in person. Um, again, Thank you very much for being with us today. We're very excited here at Golden Helix. Uh, the launch of Orsic is for us um, a very big event this year. We're very excited about this. Um, hope to see you at the ASHG uh, or speak to you on the phone sometime soon. Thank you very much and have a great day.